पहिरन पीत पटांबर सोहे पहिरन पीत पटांबर सोहे नूपुर रुनु झुनु चरनु रुनु झुनु चरनु सुंदर लाला सचि दुलाला नाच तशी हरि कीर्तन सुंदर लाला सचि दुलाला नाचत श्रीहरि कीर्तन राधा कृष्ण राधा कृष्ण एक तनु है राधा एक तनु है राधा कृष्ण एक तनु है निधुवन माझे बंसी बजा निधुवन माझे बंसी बजा विश्व रूप की प्रभु जी सही विश्व रूप की प्रभु जी सही आवत प्रकट ही नदिया में आवत प्रकट ही नदिया में सुंदर लाला सचि दुलाला नाचत श्रीहरि कीर्तन कोई गावत है राधा कृष्ण नाम र कोई गावत है राधा कृष्ण नाम कोई गावत है हरि गुण कोई गावत है हरि गुणगान मंगल तान मृदंग रसाल मंगल तान मृदंग रसाल बाजत है कोई रंगन बाजत है कोई रंगन सुंदर लाला सचि दुला नाचत श्रीहरि कीर्तन
सुंदर लाला सची लाला नाचत है कीर्तन सुंदर लाला सची लाला नाचत सिंह हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे Oh. 
हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे कृष्णा महाराज हरे कृष्णा महाराज यार माइक इज यू कैन अनम्यूट योर माइक हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा प्लीज एक्सेप्ट माय हंबल ओबिसेंसेस महाराज सो माय ओबिसेंसेस ऑल ग्लोरियस टू ऑल ग्लोरियस टू श्री प्रभुपाद हरे कृष्णा सो टुडे वी आर वेरी फॉर्चूनेट and honored to have association of uh, his holiness bhakti veg vinayashra narsingh uh, maharaj uh, so i would like to give a brief introduction about maharaj maharaj uh, was initiated by shri prabhupad in london in 1971 and uh, for last uh, uh, 25 years he is preaching in asian countries such as india philippines china taiwan singapore hong kong malaysia and thailand and uh, maharaj took 
Sanyas in 1994 and Mayapur from His Holiness Tamal Krishna Goswami Maharaj. And uh, Maharaj is well known for his sincere and faithful practice of chanting of the Holy Name of the Lord. And uh, uh, Maharaj is teaching, uh, teaching with MIHE, Mayapur Institute, since its inception. So we are very fortunate today to have association of Maharaj and uh, uh, we will hear the glories of Srila Prabhupada and some incident, uh, some uh, interactions with our Guru Maharaj as well. So we would like to welcome Maharaj by loudly chanting one time Hare Krishna Mahamantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, 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 Krishna Hare Hare. Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare, Hare Krishna Prabhu, please accept my humble obeisances, all glories to Srila Prabhupada. So I did have the opportunity to come to Ujjain, I was there for the opening. I don't know, maybe some of you saw me then. I think I came one more time. Anyway, let's begin at the beginning. I was asked to speak a little about how I came to Krishna Consciousness. Uh, I joined 1971 in Lon London, in the UK, London. I had heard about Krishna consciousness. When I, I was a student, I studied, I studied engineering. I'm from, I'm from Scotland. I studied up in Edinburgh. Hare Krishna. So I, I did my degree there up in Edinburgh and while I was studying, it was at that time the devotees had come to the UK and I remember reading the newspaper article about them. And you probably know that they, they had made friends with George Harrison from the Beatles and with his help, they had recorded the Hare Krishna mantra and it became very popular. So I remember reading, I remember watching the devotees on television and chanting Hare Krishna. So the first record they released was the Maha Mantra. And then the second record they released was the Govinda record. Govinda, the, which we play every morning in the temple room. So I remember those records and I was, I loved, I liked his records very much. I remember buying several copies and distributing some of them to my friends. I wanted them to also hear the music. I didn't really know anything about Krishna, but I was attracted because in those days that I'm talking about the 1960s, in those days, people in the West, we were very interested in the East and we were looking to the East for enlightenment. We wanted enlightenment. There was many people looking for the guru, even the Time Magazine, had the, I, I can't remember which year it was now, but they had the year of the guru. And it was, you know, everyone was thinking about having a guru, finding a guru. So I was also reading different books and my friend had been initiated by Maharishi. I was thinking about it. And I read a lot of different Eastern philosophers. Anyway, I didn't actually get connected with any, any groups. Scientology was also there. They'd also come there and they were doing their thing. Scientology is like Buddhism. So there was a lot of spiritual organizations around. 
anyway, what happened, I graduated and then I moved from Edinburgh to London. And when I was in London, working there in a job, I happened to purchase a book called Krishna, the, re the Krishna, the personality of Godhead. Oh, Krishna, yeah, Krishna, the Supreme Personality. What, no, what was it? Krishna, anyway, it was just called Krishna. A big silver book, beautiful, large book with beautiful color pictures. So I was very attracted. I immediately purchased the book. Now, while I had been living in London, I had also, I, yeah, I knew the devotees were there. And, you know, I used to purchase their incense, actually. I didn't know at the time, but they made the incense themselves and they packaged it very nicely. And on the package, it also said that we have a program at our center that you can come for sunrise meditation and we have a Sunday love feast. And so I was thinking, oh, I must go sometime. But, you know, I was living in London. There's a lot to do in London. I was very busy. Somehow I never went there. But after I got the Krishna book and I took it home and showed it to my friend. So then my friend said, hey, this is interesting. He said, you know, I think I have a book by the same person. So he went through his books and he found he had a book called The Topmost Yoga System, also by A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. So we were very impressed and uh, we read the books, got into the books and then went to the temple. He went to the temple first because he wasn't working. I, I had a job. Anyway, he went to the temple. He was my representative. So he went to the temple. Then he came back and told me I had to go. So I also went to the temple and ended up, we both became devotees. And we both got initiation by Prabhupada. Later on, he, also, he left. He had, uh, he had a wife and other commitments. So he couldn't get too much involved at that time. At, at that time, there were about 18 or 20 people living in the temple in London, all young people. There were two ladies and the rest were men. So it was really a, a brahmachari temple. The two ladies, one was French and the other one was American. That was, that was the temple. And we had Radha Landanishwara, the beautiful marble deities of Radha Landanishwara. And we also had Jagannath Baladev Subhadra. <laughs> so I, I, I went to the temple and I was attend, I used to come to the temple every evening. And very wonderful RT would take place. And the devotees were there, all young men there. And they would have this RT. The, the, the kirtan would just be ecstatic. You know, they'd be beating the drums, and dancing, and jumping up and down. And we would sweat and perspire. Our clothes would be soaking wet with perspiration. And we would just be in ecstasy, just dancing, taking part in the arti. So I just, I, it became a habit. I would come every night for the arti. So after I was coming like a couple of weeks, the devotee said to me, he said, you know, why don't you spend the night? You can stay for the evening. You can stay overnight and be here for the morning program. And then you can go to work. So I thought, well, that sounds okay. Why not? Be nice. Morning program. I haven't, I've heard about the, the sunrise meditation. Let me try it. So I started to stay overnight in the center and I go to work in the daytime. They would keep me prasadam. I come home at night and have some prasadam. And you know, this the usual pro morning morning program, RT, and then uh, I go to work and then come home at night, evening, RT. Like this I was I was enjoying 
the, the program. Nice, very nice, staying with these young men, all British men. Oh, Subag was there. Subag at that time, he, he was not even initiated at that time. He was one of the oldest. He was like, you know, I was maybe, I must have been 21. He was 31. He'd been studying there in the UK, but he'd met the devotees and he joined. And so he was staying there. That, that impressed me. He was the only Indian devotee full time. Others were all, they were all young British men, young men who were devotees. And then the, the two ladies, the one French lady and the one American lady. So we'd have wonderful kirtans and those devotees, I didn't know what they were doing all day, but I would go to work and weekends I would be around the temple. No, it's only that went on for a couple of weeks. And then devotee said to me, he said, you know, you give up that job. You don't need to go to work every day. You could work, you should be here. We need you here. And so I thought, yeah, why not give up my job? You know, people nowadays are so attached to their jobs. Of course, it's, it's a bit difficult to get jobs these days. But anyway, I just graduated from university. I wasn't too much worried about finding jobs. So I, I thought, yeah, why not? Let me give up the job. So I gave up the job and I moved in the temple full time. I went home. I was renting an apartment. I went home and I remember I got I got rid of everything. I had, you know, so many books from my college days and so many different things you collect. You know, anyway, got rid of everything, moved in the temple, and uh, they put me in charge. My first service there, I was to take care of the incense business because I found out the devotees were making the incense themselves. You know, I, I said, well, it's nice. I used to buy it. And so they said, now you make it and you, you can also distribute. You have to sell it. You go out and distribute it. And so that was my first service, helping devotees would get the devotees to do that service, help make some incense and pack it. And then what happened was another devotee came from America and they showed us, they showed us how we could uh, bottle little bottles of oil, scented oil, you know, patchouli oil and strawberry oil. And, and we, we would do these different things, making incense and oils because it was the only income practically for the temple. We were a very new society. People were not supporting us. We were very new. And then I, when I joined, I remember there was that Devanand film where he had the Hare Krishna, where they sang Hare Krishna and they showed them smoking marijuana. So people ha had some doubts about us. Are we real or are we just hippies taking drugs? So nobody was really supporting us. And that incense business was very important to maintain the movement in those days. Otherwise, we didn't have any income. We were always in debt. We rent, rented the house where the temple was. And this way we were having our program going on like that gradually. You know, devotees, more, more devotees came, more people were joining, the temple became full. When I joined, there was 20, but within a couple of years, there was over a hundred full-time devotees, young people. And, you know, it was a lot of people. So then people came from America. They trained us up how to do Sankirtan, how to organize Sankirtan. We got some vehicles. Initially, we had nothing, no vehicle. We got a vehicle. Devotees would go out traveling. So in this way, Krishna consciousness developed. So I joined there, 1971. Uh, I got initiation in 1971, Prabhupada came. Prabhupada came for the, uh, for the Janmastami, I remember. So Prabhupada was, uh, we went to, we all went to the airport to greet Prabhupada. In those days, there was not 
the security which there is now. In those days, you know, we could all be there inside the airport and everything. <laughs> but nowadays, it's so different. Anyway, Prabhupada came. We all went to the airport to greet Prabhupada. Prabhupada just came out. And he immediately got in the car and went back to the temple. So we all rushed back to the temple. It was the middle of the night. Prabhupada arrived in the middle of the night there. One, one interesting thing which happened with Prabhupada was uh, a devotee came from America, one of the senior devotees, a senior di disciple of Srila Prabhupada. He had been organizing Sankirtan and he came to London to help us organize. So when he came to England, he saw our center and he thought, oh, this house, this place which we were renting for a center, was not very big. And when he saw Prabhupada's room, he said, no, no, this is not good enough for Prabhupada. You know, we had Prabhupada's room and there was a toilet just nearby, just beside the room. So Prabhupada had his own toilet. But uh, when the devotee came, he said, oh no, he said, he said, I I'm going to write to Prabhupada and tell him we will rent him a hotel room when he comes. He, he shouldn't have to stay in this room. This is not enough. But Prabhupada wrote back and he said, I'm not going to stay in any hotel. I like that room. <laughs> so the devotee was really shocked. Anyway, we were very happy about that, that we thought this is really nice. And Prabhupada appreciates the difficulties which we're in. It was a small house, there were six or seven floors, but very small area each floor. Temple was on the ground floor. That was the initial temple, Bury Place, number seven Bury Place. It was a rented property and we, from the very beginning we had problems with the neighbors and these problems continued up until finally the neighbors managed to get an, an, an and it didn't get the government to close down temp, temp public, the government stopped public worship there. So the people couldn't come for darshan anymore. Deities were still there, but there was no programs allowed and no kirtan because we, we would make a lot of noise. It was right in the heart of London, just beside the British Museum. Anyway, we managed by Krishna's mercy, the devotees managed to relocate and they got a place just walking distance away from that one, where they are now, a place which we purchased, a place called Soho Street, number 10 Soho Street. It's also six or seven floors. And we have a restaurant on the ground floor and we have the temple above the restaurant then above the, the temple, then we have the offices and then the ashram for people to stay. So that's a temple in the center of London. Of course, at some point, George Harrison decided he wanted to help us expand the preaching there in the UK. And he purchased the Bhaktivedanta Manor for us. George had been coming to temple and you know, he was very close with Shamsundar and Guru Das, Makunda Prabhu. And, and uh, he, he, loved, he liked devotees, he admired the devotees, and he wanted to help us to establish Krishna consciousness. So he purchased that Bhaktivedanta manner. And that was a, a big help because the temple was really, our little place in London was really packed. So he got the manor for us and from there began to develop. Of course, the Bhaktivedanta Manor, it's, it's, an, it's an older British house and they have many government laws about what you can do there. Along with the house, there's a lot of land and trees and so on, but the government legisl legislation is very strict you're not allowed to chop down a tree. You're not allowed to put up any building. So many legislations. 
And so it's very difficult actually to maintain it. And so we're very fortunate that the, the, the devotees did a lot of preaching to the Indian community. There's a lot of Indian there in the UK. What happened, I remember I was in, when I joined in 71, a lot of Indians came from uh, Uganda. They had been in Uganda. They had been in Uganda and is everybody hearing me okay? Yes, Maharaj, we are able to hear. Okay. So they'd been in Uganda and they'd been put out the Uganda. The Africans took over the country and they told all the Indians, you get out. And so they could just leave with whatever they could carry. And so they came to, they, Uganda was a British colony previously. So the people there had British passports. So they came to England. And so they came to England and they came and they came with nothing practically because they'd been driven out of Africa. They came to England and the government, you know, they made arrangements for the people to stay there. And, uh, you know, they, 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 they were all mostly Gujarati people. They worked very hard and now they're very well established. And of course, there's so many other people there in UK now. But we're very fortunate to have the support of the Indian community there. Helps a lot. I had association with Prabhupada a little bit, not very much. I'm, you know, I'm not a leading devotee. I'm just a small man. I'm not a leader. And so sometimes, like one time, we went on a morning, morning walk with Prabhupada morning walk, uh, morning walk, we, we, <laughs> we got this car, uh, this car was, I don't know, Shamsundar, because we had no car and Prabhupada's coming and Prabhupada liked to go for a walk every day. So the park was a little far away. So Shamsundar didn't want to take Prabhupada in the subway or in a taxi. So he purchased this car, but this car was not, it was not roadworthy. It had many problems <laughs> and he didn't have road tags for it or anything. And somehow anyway, he took this car along and would take Prabhupada for a walk to the park. Prabhupada liked to walk in the parks every morning. Doctor had told him, good for his health, he must go for a walk. So Prabhupada had that routine. He'd go for the walk and he'd walk and he'd come back for the deity greeting. And uh, he liked to give class after the deity. Well, usually first deity greeting, then Guru Puja and then class. Guru Puja in 1971, there wasn't really Guru Puja much. I think it came a bit later. Anyway, we were on a morning walk one time and we got the twig. But Prabhupada liked to clean his teeth with this eucalyptus twig. There was no neem in London, but they had eucalyptus trees. So he said, give me some twigs from that tree. So a devotee takes off a, a branch of the eucalyptus tree. But the tree was in the park. And the park is a government property. So the policeman comes along and he sees a devotee breaking a branch off the tree. And immediately the policeman yells, what are you doing? This is the property of the queen. How can you, you can't just do that. You can't break a thing off the, a branch off the tree. This is illegal. Like the, the policeman was really upset, yelling at the devotee. After the policeman went away, Prabhupada turned to the devotee and said, he said, we have taken one little twig, but this British government, they took so much wealth from India. They took all the jewels, all those jewels in the crown of the Queen of England. They all come from India. They have taken so much. 
We're simply taking one twig and they're complaining. <laughs> Another story, I was with Prabhupada one morning in the park, just four of us, I think Shamsundar and Prabhupada, myself and another devotee. And Prabhupada saw that people, young men, sometimes they will lay down in the park and sleep. So the policeman will come by and kick them to get up. So Prabhupada saw them like that and Prabhupada turned to us and he told us this story. He said, he said, you see, they have a nice home at home, but somehow by their karma, they're not allowed to stay in their home. They come and sleep in the park and they're being kicked by the policeman to get up. And then Prabhupada told us a story about Lord Shiva, how one time Lord Shiva was with his wife Parvati in disguise and they were in the market and some beggar came and approached them for, for alms. So Parvati in her womanly nature was compassionate. She said to her husband, we should help him. We should give him some help. So Lord Shiva said, well, it's his karma. I don't think we can change it. And to illustrate the point, Lord Shiva, made, he took some jewels and he put them inside a papaya fruit, and then he gave the fruit to the, the beggar man. Of course, the beggar man didn't know the jewels were in the fruit. And so Lord Shiva gave this fruit to the beggar. And what does the beggar do? He goes and sells the fruit for a very low price because he doesn't know there are any jewels in the fruit. So Lord Shiva used this to explain to his wife, you see, he said, you see, this is his karma. He's meant to be poor. We cannot change them. So this way Prabhupada, Prabhupada was telling us how these people have some karma, strange karma, sleeping in the parks. So I was with Prabhupada. Prabhupada came to London a little while stayed a little while. At that time I got first initiation. Later on, uh, what happened was I, I'd gone to America. I wanted to get association in the USA with the, the more progressive Krishna conscious movement. They were doing a lot of sankirtan, a lot of preaching and book distribution. So I just wanted to go to America for some time. And while I was in America, at that time, Gopal Krishna Maharaj had, uh, well, Gopal Krishna, he was not a sannyasi at that time, but Prabhupada had asked him to come to India to take up GBC, to get involved with the management there in India. So Gopal Krishna Maharaj was coming to India. He wanted to have people, he asked the temple president, this was New York temple, he asked the temple leader to give him some men. So temple agreed to give two men. So I was one of them. And the reason why he picked me was because I was British. I had a British passport and British people could come to India at that in those days without a visa. And they could stay as long as they liked without any restriction. That was the situation in the 1970s. So I came to India with Gopal Krishna Maharaj, 1975. And we didn't have much going on in India. In those days, it was very primitive times. The Vrindavan temple had just been opened. And uh, I was in Delhi for some time. So we got association a little bit. Prabhupada would come there, come to Delhi before you go to Vrindavan. He would come to Delhi, just as, although there was nothing much going on in Delhi in those days. We had a little house, tiny house in Bengali market. And we had Radhapartha Sarathi. And there were about four devotees, about four devotees only. One American man, Tejas Prabhu, and his wife, Madira, and then a couple of other uh, Western devotees, people would come and go constantly because 
near Vrindavan. Vrindavan temple was there. So people were coming and come to Delhi and people come in, come from India, come into India. They come in at Delhi and they go out from Delhi. So Delhi was really like a transit temple. And it was difficult. It was difficult to maintain the temple. And Prabhupada knew it was difficult. I remember Prabhupada coming. Somehow we would accommodate Prabhupada. We would, the ladies would move aside. They'd give their the place where they were staying. They'd give it to Prabhupada. Prabhupada would just stay one night, usually. And what happened, people would come and meet Prabhupada. And I remember this one man came and Prabhupada asked him, what business do you do? And the man said, oh, I have a transport company. And so the man said, oh, you have a transport company. Prabhupada said, oh, very good. He said, you must have cars. He said, can you arrange car to take me to Vrindavan tomorrow? <laughs> so the man said, oh, yes, definitely, certainly. I'd be pleased to do that for you. Yeah, I was very impressed. Uh, Prabhupada took the initiative to arrange his own travel to go to Vrindavan from Delhi. Because in Delhi also, of course, we, had not, we didn't have our own vehicle. And so Prabhupada engaged this one man to ar arrange his transport to take him to Vrindavan. And so it, it, it lets us see what kind of, uh, how, what, how Prabhupada was so much on top of everything, organizing everything. Uh, another time in Calcutta, because I, I, I came to Delhi and then I, I was moved to Calcutta. So I was staying in Calcutta and uh, Calcutta Temple. The, of course, that's where his soul, Bhakti Charu Swami Maharaj came. So I was in Calcutta in those days when Bhakti Charu, he was coming around. What happened was you know, in India, we had no books in those days. Very difficult to do anything. To print books was very difficult. And we had two books in the whole Calcutta temple. We had a, one Bhagavad Gita and one Nectar of Devotion. So we were having class every night with the Bhagavad Gita. And Bhakti Charu was coming around and he was interested, we could see he was interested. At that time, the Kalkara temple president was Abhirama Prabhu. And Abhirama Prabhu was spending quite a bit of time talking to him and helping him and encouraging him. And he, you know, Bhakti Charu asked, you know, is there a book I can have to read? Do you have one of the books I'd like to read? So we were thinking, what book should we give him? because we thought, well, we use the Bhagavad Gita to have class every night. So maybe we can just give him the nectar of devotion. You know, some devotees were saying, you know, this boy is really serious. We should give him the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita will be the good book for him. But, you know, I said, well, look, we use that book every day for class. If you give him the Bhagavad Gita, we won't be able to have class. I said, let give him the nectar of devotion. And somehow later on, you know, he got the nectar of devotion. And then I heard years later how that nectar of devotion was the book which really clicked when he read it. It meant so much to him. He was so happy. He, he just loved that book, Nectar of Devotion. He, he said later on, he said, actually, Bhagavad Gita, it's okay but it's not like the nectar of devotion. He said, that nectar of devotion is just so wonderful. It's so well done. He really appreciated, and it convinced him that he should become a devotee. And of course he got connected to Srila Prabhupada and the rest is well known by all of you. So I, I really didn't have much dealings with Bhakti Charu Swami myself, but one, did, one thing did happen actually, that when I was taking sannyas in 1994, because Bhakti Charu Swami was very close with Tamal Krishna Maharaj. So Tamal Krishna Maharaj told me personally, he said actually, he said, I was wondering what name to give you. And he said, it was Bhakti Charu Swami who suggested this name which you have. 
this is my name, Bhakti Vigna Vinasha Narasimha. This is one of the names given by Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati for sannyas. So Bhakti Charuswami has suggested this would be a good name for me. And Tamal Krishna Maharaj told me like that. He said that he said actually this name was picked for you by Bhakti Charuswami. Although my sannyas came from Tamal Krishna Maharaj, but he told me like that that Bhakti Charuswami had picked the name. <laughs> so that was one connection which I had with Bhakti Charuswami. Otherwise, you know, the part of the world where I preach, we don't have much opportunity to meet. Maharaj did come to Hong Kong one time. I remember he was in Hong Kong when Tamal Krishna was present. He's, you know, he liked very much to be with Tamal Krishna Maharaj. They were very close. And Tamal Krishna Maharaj had great love and respect for Bhakti Charuswami. So he was very cultured, very solid in his determination and devotion. So Tamal, Tamal Krishna Maharaj liked to have his association. Uh, Bhakti Charuswami did come to Taiwan one time. I was not there at the time. I heard he came. I heard he also came into China one time, came into China, just into Guangzhou. That time when Maharaj was thinking to de develop some business, he brought some devotees, some disciples with him, and they went to the Guangzhou trade fair. But Maharaj also took time to meet the devotees and to do some kirtan with them. He played the harmonium and did some kirtan for them. So it was nice. They were happy. They got the association with a wonderful devotee. So these are some things. Maybe you want to ask some questions now? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, there is one question. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Thank you for your wonderful association. Uh, how can we develop strong in our core sadhana practices amidst so many endless services? Sorry, Prabhu, your voice is not very clear. Could you just tell me again? Yeah, Maharaj. Uh, thanks for your wonderful association. The question is, how can we develop strong in our core sadhana practices amidst so many endless services? Amidst so many endless and services. Okay. Well, <laughs> well, that's a great blessing that you've got endless services. That's very wonderful to be in that situation. If you don't have endless services, then it's a problem. But when the service is endless, it's very nice that you're always engaged in Krishna consciousness. So core practices, you know, core practices are there. You have to have your morning program. You have to you have to keep yourself, you know, regulated. You have to be able to get up in the morning for the morning program. You don't want to be sleeping late. You want to get up be it Mongol RT at least, and spend time to chant the holy name and to hear Srimad Bhagavatam, see the deities. You have to do these things. Of course, other things have to be done too. You may be involved with the deity worship. I don't know what particular services you're involved in. Maybe you're involved in managing, but whatever service you're doing, it's very nice to be fully engaged in Krishna consciousness. We, we, we want to keep that situation. We say an idle mind is the devil's workshop. And so when you're always so busy, you don't have time to think about sense gratification. I remember they said that about Jayananda Prabhu. Jayananda was one of the first disciples of Srila Prabhupada. And we have like a little samadhi there at Jagannath Mandir at Rajpur here in Mayapur. There's a Jagannath Mandir and there's Jayananda Samadhi there. And so one of the, the devotees tell about Jayananda that when people would come to him and complain or ask, what do you think of this person? What about that? 
he would say, oh, I'm too busy to think about it. I'm, I'm too busy. I've got too many things to think about. I don't have time to think about that. You know, so that, that was his mood. Keep yourself always busy. In that, in that way, then you don't have time to listen to the mind. You just have a lot to do for Krishna. It's a very healthy situation. So try to appreciate your good fortune, that you have a lot of service. Don't be lamenting about it. No, it's very nice. I was just speaking to Janani Vas Prabhu this morning. Janani Vas Prabhu was totally exhausted after the Julan Yatra. And yesterday was Balaram Purnima. So they, in the morning they had a program and they had to do special puja for Lord Balaram. And then in the evening they had the Julan Yatra again for Radha Madhava. And so he was, he, this morning he was really re exhausted. But still he was there, the morning program coming. And he was really tired. But this is the ecstasy of devotional service. Yeah, we, we, we want that situation. We, we, it's, it's not something to complain about. We should be grateful for that situation. We have a, so much to do. Yeah, we do. Devotees, every devotee has so much to do. So many rounds to chant, so many books to read, so many slokas to remember. So much to be done for the service of Krishna. And it's very wonderful. Hare Krishna Maharaj, there is another question. Uh, two devotees asked the similar question. Uh, can you please share something about preaching and challenges in countries like China, Hong Kong, where the preaching is so difficult? Well, preaching, you say difficult. I don't know if well, it's no more difficult than it is in a place like India. You know, here in India, I think preaching is also very difficult because people all already are so familiar with every religion and they have their own religion, they have their own philosophy. You know, in India, everyone's a philosopher and they all have their own ideas and speculations about things. So it's very difficult to preach here. Countries like Hong Kong, Hong Kong is di certainly different from China because Hong Kong, well, it, it was a British colony for 100 years. So we find in Hong Kong, people are very materialistic. And there is a small Indian community. There's a number of Sindhi people there and some others, some Tamils, small numbers. Not a big, not lots of people. Yeah. They, people who come there, they come for business. And when there's no business, they go back because it's expensive to stay there. It's, it's not a cheap place to live. Cost of living is very high there. So people have to work very hard and they're struggling, especially now with this situation, the business has become very bad and many people unemployed, serious problems. And so there's places like Hong Kong we don't know what the future of something like Hong Kong will be. But of course, there are Hong Kong people, Hong Kong citizens, they have nowhere, where will they go? They have to stay there. <laughs> preaching there, preaching to the Hong Kong people is also difficult, but two things are very powerful, the holy name and prasadam. So we try to have very nice prasadam and the prasadam we cook often, We'll adjust the prasadam. It will be like Chinese things rather than Indian things. The Chinese have their own kind of cooking. So we make things a little, you know, we often have like a Chinese feast and Chinese prasadam and like that. We, and Chinese people, they, they do like music and a number of them do like to come and learn the instruments. They learn the mridanga and harmonium these things, they, they take an interest in these things, some, some people. So we've managed to make some devotees there. It's not a gold mine, it's not a, a lot of devotees, but we do have our devotees there. 
And the main thing is to make them feel comfortable that the temple is for them. And uh, like I say, the prasada, very important. And kirtan, it's also very good for them. They like to hear. And a few people, a few rare people, they take an interest in the philosophy. It's not an easy place to preach Hong Kong. China is a bit better, but in China, the problem is the government, that the government are, they don't, they don't encourage proselytization. And other, they don't want people coming to preach there, particularly foreigners. That's very much against the Chinese government's policy because it's a communist country and communist philosophy is that religion is the opium of the people. So they don't want the people to be religious, rather the, the philosophy of China is atheism. That's from Karl Marx, he was an atheist. So it's not that everybody in China is good. There are a lot of atheists and a lot of materialistic people there, but it's a big population. You have a lot of people. And so you can always find some people interested. You just have, we have to be patient and you have to be willing to take some risks. You have to be willing to accept some austerities, just like, you know, going to China, you cannot wear the dress, the, you can't go around in dhoti and kurta anymore. You can't be having a big sika and putting on tea like on your face. Westerners or foreigners anyway, can't, cannot do these things that would bring too much attention to you. And you go into China, you're not going to get much kirtan. There's not going to be much opportunity for kirtan because everyone lives in big buildings. And so you're in a building, you're in an apartment, the whole building will hear the kirtan. Then they will complain. And immediately people will come and tell you what this is, what's going on. And if they think it's religion, they'll call the police and the police will come, then it's big problems. Mm. And some of our devotees have been ex uh, deported from China. Some local devotees have had problems also. They get held in the police station, sometimes for several days, sometimes even longer. Sometimes the ladies are held in the police station. Sometimes there's fines also, they have to pay fines. And they also, the, the police come, they, will, they go to your house, they can take whatever they want. They can confiscate everything, whatever you've got there, they can take it. You don't have a lot of rights. So it's difficult. And there's many dangers, but still we try to do something. We have to try to give Lord the mercy of Lord Chaitanya. And some people are responding, but it's, it's not easy. But because it's no, because peop, some because many people have, have not been exposed to too much, it's kind of like having an open slate. You know, in India, people have already got so many things written on their slates, so many different ideas and philosophies. But you go to China, it's more like a open a, a blank slate. There's nothing there. They don't know much. But it's changing very fast. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other question? Yes, Maharaj, there are uh, two more questions. Um, how can we get deeply connected to devotional service like a deep water? How can we get perfection in Krishna consciousness? How can we get connection 
deep, like in deep water, how we can get a good connection to Krishna consciousness and how can we get perfection in Krishna consciousness? Well, you need to get association with the devotees. You have to get the right association. Devotees, very important. If you can get the mercy of the senior devotees by the mercy of the spiritual master, then you get the mercy of Krishna. So we have to please the spiritual master. That's very important. Yeah, I'm sure many of you have got a lot of instructions from His Holiness Bhakti Swami, what he wanted, what he wants, how he wants to develop the Jain, how he wants to see everything maintained there. So you get the mercy of Krishna by the mercy of the spiritual master. We have to be faithful to the orders of the spiritual master. And that makes perfection for us very a, a, a reality. It becomes a reality. Just like Srila Prabhupada was meditating how to perfect his Krishna consciousness. And he read that purport from the Bhagavad Gita, Vaya Vasayatmika Bhuti, Ekeha Kuranandana, Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur's purport to that verse from Bhagavad Gita. And he read about the importance of the order of the spiritual master, how that order of the spiritual master has to become the life and soul for the disciple. So that's how you can actually get very strong connections. If we become very much attached to that order of the spiritual master, we can get a good connection and we can go on to get perfection. It's all based on that being chaste and faithful to the order of the spiritual master. And Prabhupada shows that in his own life. Prabhupada, his spiritual master told him, if you ever get money, use it to print books. Prabhupada did that. That was his life. He didn't worry about money. He didn't worry about buildings. George Harrison came and gave a building. Amberish gave a building in Detroit. They gave another one in Hawaii. People gave land in Vrindavan. He didn't, he used the money, books, got to go for books because his art, the order of the guru was there. And the order of the guru also about the GBC that set up the GBC, these kind of things. So Prabhupada shows you follow the order of the guru, you'll get perfection. Hmm. Other question? Yes, Maharaj. Uh, there is a question. Hare Krishna Maharaj Dhanavad Pranam. Uh, Guru Maharaj showed in himself how to do deal with devotees. But sometimes even if I try best, sometimes devotee gets upset. How I can deal with that? Can I hear the beginning of the question again, Prabhu? Uh, yes, Maharaj. Uh, Guru Maharaj showed in himself how to deal with devotees. But sometimes, even if I try best, devotees gets upset. How can I deal in that situation? Yes, dealing with devotees, we know it's not an easy thing. And maybe it's not a good idea just to try to do exactly as Bhakti Chaturaswami would do, because he had a different position you know he was he was very much seen he's a he was the accepted authority and senior and he had his own personality and style of way in doing everything you have to develop your own character and your own your own method in dealing with the devotees you have you have to develop your own strategies, your own me means of working with the devotees. It comes, it depends a lot on personal relationships. You have to be very personal with the devotees. Understand the devotees are, 
have given their life for Krishna. So they're very valuable. So we have to show our respect and appreciation for the devotees. And we can't just be, you know, just doing as, as Bhakti Churu Swami would do. You can't just, just follow him. You have to develop your own relationship with the devotees. He had his relationship with them. You have to develop your relationship with them. And you have to, you know, pray to Krishna and pray to the devotees, encourage them the importance of working together because the success of our movement depends on how much we can all work together. As Prabhupada said, your love for me will be shown by how you cooperate to keep this movement together after I am gone. So this is, it, it's, it's there everywhere, in every place. We have these problems, the difficulties, devotees getting along. Of course, one of the main problems is because devotees are neophyte. Now, neophyte devotees especially, they're going to have this problem. When Prabhupada would get letters from devotees complaining, Prabhupada said, again, this neophyte tendency, complaining, complain, complaints. So we really want to encourage the devotees not to just only complain, but to see the good, to try to be positive and to see the good things in the devotees. When, Prabhupada, when somebody would write to Prabhupada glorifying the devotees, Prabhupada would be very happy, very pleased that, ah, you're doing very, I can understand you're doing very nicely in Krishna consciousness. Just like one devotee in England, he wrote to Prabhupada and he was describing how we go out and distribute books and how it's very cold in the winter, but we take the snow, we, we, we jump out and into the snow and we take bath, rub the snow over our bodies for taking bath. And we don't mind the little bit of austerity. It's bliss for us because we're so happy to distribute your books. So when Prabhupada got that letter, Prabhupada was so pleased. He said, this is, this is Krishna consciousness. Accepting austerities on behalf of Krishna and being joyful about it not complaining. So we really have to always try to encourage devotees, you know, get them to be positive and to be enthusiastic, to see the good. Yeah, there are problems, things maybe not going right just now, especially very difficult situation, very unique situation in the history of the world. We never had this before. You know, I've been on this planet for so many long time now. I never experienced anything like this before. Very special situation. So it's very testing and challenging for us. We all have to really strengthen our Krishna consciousness by very faithfully hearing and chanting and controlling the mind, working against the doubts which come into the mind. We have to be very diligent in this matter to get these doubts that demon, that, that what Krishna is called Madhusudana. You could kill the demon Madhu. So doubts are like demons. So we have to keep Krishna in the mind. We have to remember that Krishna's representative, Bhakti Charu Swami and Srila Prabhupada, glorious, wonderful devotees who dedicated their life for the service of Krishna. So we, we should always be thinking how to please them. What can we do to please them, to make them happy? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, these were all questions from different devotees. And so we are very thankful for your wonderful, inspiring association. We express our heartfelt gratitude to Your Holiness for enlightening us. Especially you narrated your early days in Krishna consciousness and the past time, the, the past time that happened with Shri Prabhupada during morning walk, this eucalyptus 
tweak uh, and uh, then how Prabhupada is telling about uh, this British. And then um, you uh, share some of your interactions with Guru Maharaj, especially your name, sannyas name giving by Guru Maharaj. And uh, you told that how Jayananda Prabhu gave the example of Jayananda Prabhu, that uh, how services are the blessings and uh, we should in we should realize the ecstasy of devotional services. Uh, you told, you shared uh, about preaching and challenges in Hong Kong and China. And uh, you told about the perfection in Krishna consciousness. You, key the, you told the keys, having the right association, mercy from senior devotees and a spiritual master, and being faithful and chaste to follow the instructions of the spiritual master. And at last you told about how Krishna consciousness is uh, about taking hardships for Krishna and uh, relishing it. So we beg for your blessings, Maharaj, to empower us so that uh, we can follow all these teachings and can become a loyal servant of Shri Prabhupada and serve in the ISKCON for life. And we would like to invite you again uh, already you visited Ujjain, but we want to have more of your association at Ujjain. So we seek your uh, uh, blessings and uh, we express our heartful gratitude by chanting one time Hare Krishna Mahamantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. His Holiness Bhakti Vigna Vinas, the Shing Swami Maharaj, Ki Jai. Jai, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai. Gaur Premanande, Hare Bo. Hare Hare Krishna.